Do you ever switch between feeling like you're either not doing enough or that you're doing way too much when it comes to the gospel? Both burnout and boredom can come with their own set of challenges. So what can we do to find the balance and feel assured in whatever step of the journey we are in? Hi, and welcome to Magnify. We are a podcast that helps keep General Conference top of mind without adding to your to-do list. I'm your host, Katherine Davis, a mom, a seminary teacher, and a big football fan who loves God. And I am so excited to learn and be inspired with you. We know life is busy, and we are here to lighten the load by bringing you weekly spiritual reminders that will leave you feeling a little bit better than before. Joining me today is Magnify contributor Mindy Brown. Mindy is squeezing in today's conversation with all of her responsibilities at Divinity School. She has some really great spiritual insights from Elder Bednar's message from this last general conference in the path of their duty. I have been looking forward to talking about this with you. Every single time I talk to you, I always feel so enlightened and uplifted. So I think this is going to be an amazing conversation. It's going to be fun. So before we get in, Mindy, I do have one question for you. Okay. And this is what I want to know. As we we kind of get into Elder Bednar's talk, you are going to talk about some of the spiritual reminders that you had during this this talk, but do you feel right now that you are in a season of underwhelm or overwhelm? <laughs> oh, I probably have to go with overwhelm. <laughs> Yes, but I'm looking forward to the underwhelm that is on the near horizon. So yay. So as we are about to dive into this talk, can I just ask you, is there anything that has stood out to you as you've reflected on this talk or prepared for this podcast? Yes, yes. Actually, this this has been such a fun talk to study um, because it's one that I felt maybe more than others that I could peel away layers and just get deeper and deeper into it and keep finding more meaty things. And uh, the most recent revisit I had with it, it just cracked wide open to me. I was thinking about the positioning of this address, and this was the very first on Saturday morning. And I just started thinking, man, that would be a unique kind of pressure to be assigned the opening address of conference weekend, right? And as I thought about, you know, what what would be the advice for that speaker in that position? I thought, well, first, like you wouldn't want anything boring, right? Because you got to start off with a little bit of excitement right out of the gate to keep people tuned in. You don't want so, anybody turning it off, exactly. Right you got to like, yeah, you got to get a little hook there. So, so you got to have some stories and some good imagery, which I just think he nailed. I, I think the pioneer stuff was great. But then I think you also would be thinking, I can't overwhelm anybody right out of the gate either. We need to kind of gradually build up here. So like, what would be the message that would help everybody just kind of relax into this and think, oh yeah, I'm loving this. I am really happy to be here and have my weekend devoted to this. And then I think the third thing that occurred to me is I would want to make a bridge to the last conference session and kind of give some evidence that I like had revisited the last conference. I mean, other, you know, you just don't want to come out of nowhere. You want it to feel like it's somehow connected. And so I was thinking, you know, what was like, what was the really capstone message of six months previous and like peacemakers needed, right? I mean, absolutely. That yeah. felt like that capstone message. and. Then as I went back to my notes, all of a sudden, I just saw all these connecting points. And I thought, wow, like this kind of gives me a little window into an apostle of the Lord's mind of how you could spend six months really pondering a capstone prophetic message like peacemakers needed and figure out how that, how you are going to change because of that message. And I think what we have in this talk from Elder Begnar is just this little glimpse into him as a very real person, maybe realizing, oh, here's this one little angle I could do better on. 
And he really addressed it so humbly. I mean, there are a couple of lines in here that I just like melted for it, thinking, oh, my word, that's that is a view into Elder Bednar's heart right there. Like when he says, your strong faith in Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and your unpretentious, consecrated lives inspire me to be a better man and disciple. I love you. I admire you. I thank you. And I commend you. I mean, at that moment, weren't we all thinking, bring it on. I got 10 hours of TV in me. I, I'm so excited for this conference session because it was just a humble moment from an apostle of the Lord being really sincere. And so anyway, that to me has been the most exciting layer that I've kind of connected through it in pairing those two. And I think as we keep talking, we'll have lots of touch points that we can kind of go back and forth between them. But I thought that was super interesting. It, it gives me a different way to approach conference study. Well, isn't that line from Elder Bednar? And, and I love the idea of thinking of how he tried to implement a prophet's advice and, and a prophet's plea to all of us. And it just, you know, President Nelson's, President Nelson's statement here, his true disciples build, lift, encourage, persuade, and inspire. Uh, yes. And isn't that exactly what Elder Bednar did in that line? Yes, completely. I loved that. I totally loved that part. There were so many great parts in there. And, and just inviting us to interact with others in a higher, holier way. Like really, that you, that's the summary of Elder Bednar's talk. How do you interact with others in a higher, holier way? So let's dig into what Elder Bednar says and figure out how we can interact with others in a higher, holier way. Your first kind of takeaway was this reminder that whether you're struggling with overwhelm or underwhelm, the answer is the same, more Jesus. Definitely. And I'm so curious about these two ends of the spectrum for you, because I know often you're more in overwhelm, which I think so many of us are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the more Jesus for both of these yeah. spectrums. Yeah. Well, I mean, first I would say, and I think so many of us feel this way, and I would love to change this about myself, but I think I walk a really fine line, like tightrope, fine line between being too busy and being bored. Like, why yeah. can't I widen that? Like, I want the toddler size balance beam instead of the tightrope, right? <laughs> like, like, let's have a big space where anywhere in that realm is my happy place. But I just feel like I'm constantly dancing on either side of that line. And that's frustrating to me. That's like a mortality pushing on me, right? I'm look forward to overcoming that sense and being able to keep the more middle ground more peacefully. But um, I just think that it's, it's easy to feel like when you're in overwhelm mode, oh, I've got to be gritty. I've got to be patient. I've got to be more trusting, all of that. And sometimes we forget that underwhelm mode, actually, you need to be gritty. You need to like, you know, bootstrap it a little bit and be like, Hey, I can find a way to matter right now and be patient until something shifts and you feel a little more appreciated or noticed or whatever. And just more trusting that, that you're still doing the work and everybody's doing their part. And, you know, just the whole body of Christ moment there that, that even fingernails are really important, right? Let's like, just because you're not the right hand driving the boat right now, it's all good. That There are good things for it. I just, I think that it's an interesting juxtaposition and sometimes we forget. I just remember once, and this is crazy that I remember this. This is probably 35 years ago. A friend that I was visiting with just saying, yeah, my husband and I are kind of in an interesting spot right now. He's overwhelmed and I'm underwhelmed. And we're trying to kind of work with that tension. And that has struck, stuck with me so profoundly through all these years because so often it is this little bit of a dance and especially with the people we're closest to. And it, it's really helpful if we can appreciate, okay, you're in a little season of overwhelm right now. I'm a little underwhelmed, so I could help you out. You know, maybe we could balance a little better. Maybe we could share the load a little differently or whatever. And I just think always the answer is turn to the Lord right? T take it to him, hand it over to him and 
just get some guidance, get some some better discernment through the spirit. Just stay close to the Lord, whether you're on the left side of the tightrope line or the right side, whichever way you're about to fall off, you know, don't fall. Grab his hand and hang on. And he's there for both. So what does that look like for you right now? Like more Jesus, when you're in a little period of overwhelm, how do you accomplish that? How do you find more Jesus? You know, for me, I, I've really noticed in the last year and a half or so that I've been back in school and juggling a little bit more than I had for a while there. The Book of Mormon is totally the answer for me. It doesn't take much if I can take five minutes seriously focused on just a beautiful passage. And, and honestly, I get like hung up on certain pages. Sometimes I can go weeks without even turning the page because there's just a part that I'm just loving. And it just is really peaceful to just read it over and over again. And, you know, every morning I can do that. And I mean, for me, I work in like silly patterns, but right now the pattern that's working really well for me is after I blow dry my hair, while I'm waiting for my flat iron to heat up, I've got a couple minutes and I keep my scriptures right there in my closet. I just sit on my floor and I just take those minutes to not waste. Like I don't need to scroll on my phone those couple of minutes. I can go to my scriptures first thing in the morning and it just puts my day in a good focal point that kind of helps the rest of the day. So I always ask myself when I'm starting to fall apart, I think I've been reading my Book of Mormon every day because it makes a huge difference to me. And I believe that he can absolutely magnify those few moments that we have to offer. Absolutely. Isn't that the truth? Yes. Yeah. And like you were saying, I think we're all in different stages and we'll go through different stages of underwhelm and overwhelm. But sometimes with the overwhelm, we're in a more visible stage or the underwhelm, we're in a less visible stage. So how do we navigate all the places in between and still feel valued? It can feel like whiplash, right? Don't you think? (laughs) You're just getting yanked back and forth and all of that. But, um, you know, I, I think one way is to really get in the habit of noticing everyone else in their positions because it makes you so much more aware of, oh, this is normal. Like I'm not unusual. I'm not weird. Everybody's got their different place. And, you know, one of the things that I really value and appreciate so much about the organizational structure of our church is our hierarchy, if we're even going to use that term, is a completely two-dimensional hierarchy. It's really not three-dimensional. It's just on paper and it's written in pencil, Mm. right? Like if you're in a big spot now, well, great. You know, you're getting released eventually and you're going back to the other, maybe more minor role or whatever. It just moves around. I mean, like we always joke about the classic example of the stake president who then goes and works in the nursery. But that is so valuable. It's so helpful to see that that is always the way. And it's a gorgeous, brilliant design. It really is. So Mindy, have you ever felt like you were in the underwhelm or the less visible? And did that ever get discouraging to you? How did you find more Jesus in those moments? Well, you know what, actually, I was thinking it's the last time I was reading through this, um, just earlier today, actually, I I just had this like flashback to a memory. Um, I love Elder Bednar's long list he gave of like all the different people doing their things in the church, right? The whole second half of the talk is like the translators and the nursery workers. And he mentioned, he drew from a phrase that, um, Sister Julie Beck had used when she was the General Relief Society president about the lioness at her gate. And that just brought such a flashback to me of a day, it was several years ago, but a Sunday morning that I had just, I can't remember what took me into one of my children's closets. And I just found something in there that was just a confirmation to me that things weren't going so well for this child. And 
I had suspected that, but this was a more tangible confirmation than I had had up to that point. And honestly, it was devastating to me. And I, I held this cup, it was a cup <laughs> in my hand. And I just thought, don't fall apart. Like you got to go leave for church in 10 minutes, hold it together. Think about this later. Just put your shoes on and do the thing. Go to church, go through these motions, shut down that emotion for now. I went into church. I had one of my other children with me there and we sat in the back. Atypically, we usually sat more on the soft seats further up, but we sat in the back because I just felt like I just kind of wanted actually to be invisible. I didn't want anybody to look at me compassionately or kindly because I didn't want to break down over it. I didn't want to talk about it. And at the end of the meeting, I stayed in my seat for a minute and I really was contemplating, like, do I even have the emotional bandwidth to get up and go to Relief Society? Because I just keep thinking about that cup I was holding in my hand earlier. And the kindest older gentleman came over and it was just like, he just saw me and he stopped and just sat down. He didn't even like ask in passing. He actually sat down and said, Hey, how are you doing? And he happened to then ask about this child and oh, floodgates opened, right? And, and it was a moment of embarrassment, but it was also, no, you know what? Who cares about embarrassment? Like, it's fine. He actually cares. And I just had, I probably took 10 minutes to explain to him and he wasn't in a hurry. He just listened. And I just said, you know, I don't think she's doing very well. Listen to what happened before I came to church. And I'm just feeling like, man, all these years of hard work, is it, did it matter? Is it ever going to like come together and fit? And, and I knew that, that this gentleman in particular had had a similar experience with a child. And I think that helped me feel like I could kind of open up a little bit to him and he just couldn't have been kinder. And, and his reassurance was just, well, it's going to be okay. Like, look at, my, look at my child. Like, it's all good. Could I ever have imagined being where we are now? And I was where you were. There, those days are the worst, but it's okay. It's going to be okay. And honestly, that was like the sweetest interchange I'd had at church for a long time. It meant the world to me. And sorry, I get a little bit emotional, but no. but it just made me realize Man, I've got to pay more attention. Like, don't ask in passing. Don't keep walking as you ask. Sit down next to the person who is sitting in the back and really ask and then listen. So I, I hope I, I hope I have made strides in that direction. I do try. And um, I think it just, it makes a huge difference. It just helps someone feel seen and loved and understood and and really, who cares if you start to cry, right? Like, that's just the spirit. That's just kindness kind of leaking from your eyes. And it's fine. Keep a tissue in your pocket. Go ahead and cry. Sometimes that's what it takes. I think that's the power of church. Yes. Is that we can come and hopefully come with open eyes to see. Yeah. Really, it's all the communal nature of it. It. Like, yeah. what would be the point of doing it by yourself? That is the point of church. You know, I mean, you've probably yeah. had moments like that, right? You're so busy with seminary and your family and all the things you do. And, you know, I don't know. Can you think of a time, Catherine, that you just really had somebody notice and see and say? Well, and I, and I think, especially at that time, and as we're talking about what Elder Bednar is saying is like the answer is the same, whether you're an overwhelm or underwhelm and it's, and it's turning to the savior, but sometimes in less visible ways, you can often feel like you're overlooked or that you're not valuable or that you're not needed. Yes. And I know for years I felt that I was a mom and, and I struggled day to day to try and do everything in the home. And then I had come to church and I just felt like I'm not needed here. I'm not valuable here. Or, 
you know, I'd be, I, I was in a particular call, calling for seven years with my husband. And I just thought, okay, they just put me here and left me and totally forgot about me. Cause I've been here for seven years That's and it's just the easy place to stick Catherine, right? Just go stick her with a bunch of 16, 17 year olds and leave her there for seven years, <laughs> which I, I was feeling very forgotten and very, um, unseen. And I felt like maybe this is, this is all there is for me. And about into our seventh year, an event, a tragedy happened in our ward with one of the youth. And I knew why I was there. And I knew why I had to be serving with them for seven years up to that point. And I just think there are things that we don't know or, or we don't see. And sometimes we can compare. And I think that leads us into like your second point, because sometimes we compare, yeah. oh, look what they're doing and look at the difference they're making. And I am not doing that. And that's your second reminder from this talk. Don't compare, consecrate. Yeah. Because yeah. I think it feels nearly impossible not to compare, Mindy. I think oh, it does. that is so who we are. Even that story that he shares from the scriptures is all about comparison. Exactly. Exactly. Like, isn't that striking when you really stop to think, like, what is this phrase that now he's made so well renowned within the church? Like, no less serviceable. I mean, that is a, alluding to comparison right there. And what a great example. Like, who's not going to feel kind of less than when you're comparing yourself to Captain Moroni, right? Like, he's the rock star of, of the Book of Mormon. And you think about these poor brothers who are like, oh, I'm just going through, I mean, seven years doing this thing. And, yeah. you know, raising the kids. You have the teenagers. It's a pretty thankless job. And, and just that phrase alone is this reminder of comparison creeping in. And um, I loved in his talk that, you, you know, how the footnotes of our conference talks have just gotten richer and richer and richer. And they put so many great gems there. And in Elder Bednar's talk, he specifically, like, even articulates that he's drawing from these two great talks from Elder Clark much earlier and then from Howard W. Hunter. And this one from Howard W. Hunter that was so great um, if you really spend some time in that, like he had just this two outstanding statements there. He says, why do we serve when we understand why we won't be concerned about where we serve? Like, like take it right back to the roots of well, why do we even have callings and why do we accept them and say, oh, yeah, OK, I'll do it. You know, well, if the point is to contribute and to be part of the body of Christ, really, it doesn't matter where you're at, we everybody's just got to do their part. Everybody can lift where they stand, right? Like President Uchtdorf had said. But then President Hunter also said in that same, it was a BYU devotional, I believe, he says, serve and grow faithfully and quietly. And what a great summation of consecration, right? Consecrated lifestyle, sometimes it looks really flashy and like, oh man, look at her go. She does all the things. And other times it's like, serve and grow faithfully and quietly. And I just love that that simple sentence from President Hunter. And that, that just sounds so like him to me as well. I mean, you remember, he was such a kind, gentle, unassuming sort of man. So how do you turn comparison to consecration in your mind and in your heart? Because it's really natural to compare. We're all doing it all the time. And to say, stop comparing, I think that's really hard. So how can you turn it from, because I think we're going to compare, we're just going to do it. Yeah. So how can you turn it from comparison to consecration? Well, I think one really interesting point that like, here's an example of just really digging into talks and finding multiple layers. But um, when you examine that verse, the no less serviceable verse in Alma, that's Alma 4819, if you keep right. reading right? Because that's like, that's a trick, I think, of studying conference talks. You read what came before the verse they're quoting from and what comes after and just see if adding a little context, you get a little bit more from it. But the incredible thing that just jumped off the page to me 
in doing that was in the very next verse, in verse 20 of Alma 48, it explains what the conditions became like for those people there. And it says they were free from wars and contentions among themselves. And like, there's that word. I mean, that just pulls you right back to peacemakers needed, right? When President Nelson had all those things to say about contention. And when you realize, wait, like not comparing, but appreciating that we're all living a consecrated life. We're all trying. That's the goal. And everybody's just doing their best with the current place they're at, wherever they're penciled into that 2D chart, right? That maybe hangs on the bishop's wall so we can keep track of where everybody's serving right now or whatever. Wherever you're at, in doing that happily, that builds unity. Like that's peace. That's the way to fight the contention that often arises in every organization, not just a ward, but a family or a neighborhood or a club, whatever, your ladies tennis group, whatever. I think when you can appreciate that, hey, we're all doing our job right now. We're all doing our best. You're doing awesome. I'm trying. It, it's a unity builder. And that creates peace. So Mindy, tell me how you would do that. Tell me how you would replace comparison with kindness. Well, I actually think what Elder Bednar modeled was a spectacular way that could apply to each of us to forget yourself for a minute and just look around and start building other people up. Because I think when you can do that, when you can let go of resentment and replace it with gratitude, it's amazing the difference that makes, right? I mean, that's huge. I remember a, a, a time, a, a phase, a season, really, when my husband was in his training, his like postdoctoral training. And I mean, talk about him being overwhelmed and me being underwhelmed. I just was feeling like I was just stuck at home with a couple little kids all the time and you know, nothing to do but dishes and laundry and all of that. And I was really praying about how can I fight this because I'm feeling resentment. And resentment is so problematic in a marriage. It it just really can rip things apart quickly. I mean, if you want Satan to join the party, just start resenting each other, right? And I had the strongest impression that I needed to pray out loud with the little kids to be grateful for dad, like to just like, like go overboard. I call it doing Ann Shirley, like, you know, Anna Green Gables, just pull out all the stops. And to the point of maybe it almost being a joke, just knock yourself out for expressing gratitude. And I knelt down that evening with my kids to do that. And that's exactly what I did. And at first it was a little Anne Shirley-ish and maybe didn't seem super sincere, but a couple sentences in and like I was in tears thinking, oh yeah, I do love him for doing this. I do love the sacrifice he's making. He doesn't want to be gone from us all the time either, but like he's looking at the bigger picture and it's all going to balance out again eventually. And it's seasons, right? It's phases. Well, and such a powerful example because you didn't replace it until you started. Yeah, totally. Like going through doing the motions, something, literally. Right? Yeah. It's not like, okay, replace it now. And yeah. then we just sit back and wait for the comparison to be replaced with kindness. Like yes. We have to start being kind yep. and then see how that can be replaced. Yeah. Isn't that true? Some, like we think that you got to think it first and then do it. And like think think celestial, of course, that often is a really great idea. But sometimes the reverse is really helpful too. do it, like fake it till you make it right. Yeah. So I think that's such a good reminder. And it leads us into your third spiritual reminder, which is your final one. And that is everyone has something valuable to share based on their unique place in line. What do you mean by place in line, Mindy? Well, I think if we picture that image, uh, like we started talking about with the pioneers and everything of that wagon train, I think it's 
really interesting to dig into the idea of what the people at the end of the wagon train were learning through their experiences that were maybe very different than what the people out front were learning, right? Like there were two different skill sets being internalized based on where they stood in that line, right? The people at the back had to figure out how to contend with the dust that all the wagons in front of them were kicking out. The people at the front didn't even think it was dusty, right? They, they would have heard somebody complain about the dust and they'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about. It's not dusty, right? I right. mean, that's kind of a crazy way to think of it, right? But yeah, but they're figuring out this whole other thing. The people at the end, they didn't have anybody right behind them on their heels, like keeping them moving. It would be really easy to start to lag and slow down. And then, oh, the loneliness. And take a long little yeah. break. <laughs> take, a, take a long break, right? Or just sit down yeah. and pretty soon you can't even see them anymore. And you're like, you know what? Leave it. It's fine. I'm going to stay here. This is as good a place to build a cabin as whatever <laughs> we're about to find, right? I mean, so yeah. there's a whole different skill skill set that they're learning back there. And I think in a really macro, big world sense, I think... We're in a, in a place in the history of things right now where this is becoming, I think, more clear to us that everyone you meet has a different set of experiences to bring to the table that is very, very valuable. And I think any, any group you might be able to pull together of perhaps the less noticed or the less seen, if you could sit at their feet and just ask, tell me what you learn that I don't know. And, and I just think that bigger picture is huge. It changes everything, right? So can you think of a time when you have learned something recently from someone at the end of the line who's dealing with the dust? Well, I right now I work with a BYU freshman stake on campus, and I've been doing that for a few years. And especially in these last few years, post-COVID and everything, all the hard things going on in the world right now, the, the mental health challenges are just immense, immense, right? Especially for yeah. our young adult population. And sometimes when I am really privilege to have that space and moment with them just for these heart to heart talks. And they can explain to me like, you know, this is what my last year has looked like. This is what I'm wrestling with. I think, Oh man, I, I have had it easy and there is so much I can learn from you. Like I need your grit. I need your patience your desire to just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Because if I felt like that, I don't know that I would. And look at you. You are an example of getting back out of bed day after day and hanging in there. And and it's just so humbling. I mean, I really think that's what Elder Bednar was feeling and what he was expressing when he was saying, I love you. I admire you. I commend you. It was a deep sense of humility that that his position affords him a different set of learning skills uh, and a different education than the rest of ours, maybe. And each of us have some really valuable things that we need to share with one another. Well, Mindy, I, for so many reasons, I think that was such a powerful metaphor. Uh, first of all, the idea of the line being at a different place in the line, it reminded me of this quote from Elder Oaks. And I know you know this quote where he said that there is no up or down in the service of the Lord. There's only forward or backward. Uh, and that yes. difference depends on how we accept and act upon our releases and our callings. And I think sometimes, especially with the trap of comparison and in the church, we view people as an up and down. Mm -hmm. And I, I love the Elder Bednar brought to our mind about this image and this metaphor of a line that, that it's not up and down. It's only backwards and forward. 
Yeah. And that we're going to be at different parts of that line. And part of it is learning from the people and, you know, at a different place in front of us or a different place behind us. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? And then just think too, like, you know, this scripture so well, where Christ says that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Right. And, and he is the first and the last alpha and omega. And I just think that concept that he has been at every place in that line validates or lifts up every single position because every single position is Christ-like. Right. If he's been everywhere in there, right? Like there's a great kind of linguistic language term for when the Bible uses phrases like that. It's called a merism when it uses two ends of the spectrum to really try to give the sense that it's the first and the last and everything in between. And I think when you read those, especially from Hebrew, uh, like Old Testament verses, that's really what they were trying to portray is it's not just that he's the first and the last, he's every single spot. He has been wherever you currently are and understands. And he's there to hold your hands through it as you keep moving forward. Just keep taking those steps, one step after another. It's kind of the difference between trail blazing and trail beating, right? Like, like huh. you often think of those people at the front of the line as the trailblazers, like they've got their machete and they're like bushwhacking and opening the space for the path. But the path doesn't get formed until all those footfalls keep pressing it down. And that's the trail beating that has to happen. And everybody in the line is doing it. First, last, and everyone in between. And I just think that's that's maybe the thing to be thinking. We're just, we're making that path for everyone else who will follow and keeping it clear. I just think that's a big idea. I love that image. The wagon train image is a good one, especially when you consider that these are the latter days. Like we're all at the end of the wagon train. And even if we're the unknown or unnamed, we're beating down that trail for all those who are coming after in that line. Yeah. Here's my question for you. As we wrap up this conversation, you know, we love to end every conversation with a small and simple challenge. And we've talked about some pretty big ideas, but how do we apply that to one little step at a time to beating down that trail? So what is something small and simple that we can do to continue to press forward? Yeah. You know, I think such a simple little thing, and I think it was what Elder Bednar modeled so beautifully for us, is to learn someone's name and use it. Like there is someone, maybe it's the guy at the drink drive through window who hands you your soda, whatever, right? He's probably got a name tag on. And if he doesn't, you could say, hey, I'm Mindy. What's your name? You know, and then use it when you see him there the next time. I just think, I, I think his eyes would light up, right? There's someone at the grocery store that you've seen they're putting the produce on for years and you don't know their name, but you could introduce yourself and ask. And, you know, it, it's so simple. It feels awkward for a second, but I think once you start learning each other's names, it just blows things wide open for love to just really pour through. Because it helps us feel seen and valued. And even yeah. Elder Suarez says there's a power in the name. Yes, absolutely. There's a power that comes when we use people's names. Yeah. So I'm really anxious to hear what difference that can make in people's lives and how we can continue this conversation. Yeah, let's do it. Let's continue the conversation. Let's all get over onto Instagram, follow Magnify and join in. Tell us you know, what layers you found in this talk, how you're applying it, your place in line, where you currently feel you are on that tightrope walk between overwhelm and underwhelm. There's so much we can learn from each other. I mean, that's the whole point of this talk, right? Let's listen and learn from each other. So get on and share your insights with us. 